Okay, people, I think we've, uh, everyone's got managed to get something to drink, something to eat, so we can now get down to the important stuff. Huh? Uh, first off, welcome to what is the third installment of this year's 20th, century, 20th anniversary uh, Philosophy Club lecture series. Um, and today we have a very special uh, speaker. Uh, he's the head of the department, I'm sure you all know him, uh, Professor Stefan Steltzer. He's been a, an ubiquitous presence at AUC for some time now. Don't mention. Yeah. Uh, and uh, indeed has made a significant contribution to this place in general. And as a personal, on a personal note, he, he won the teaching award in uh, 2006. Okay. Um, he's been interested in the notion of place for a very long time now. Indeed, almost 10 years ago, he noted uh, that in relation to the philosophy department itself, it should be more than a place to acquire techniques and skills of how to get ahead in the daily round of life, but a place that grants them the luxury of pause, turn inward, and become amazed at the beings they are and the world they live in. Maybe then they will look at their education as something of a real value and as a never-ending process. As such, the notion of place plays and continues to play an important role in his thinking, and he returns to this thread today under the title, Who Needs a Place to Think? So I turn it now over to you. Thank you. Well, do you, do you hear me when I speak like this? Okay. Uh, uh, I'm surprised to hear that, what you just dug out. Uh, but so it, it's, uh, the interest in place seems to be for me older than I can remember. So uh, today, of course, uh, I have been asked why, why that subject, what do you mean by it? And uh, to begin with, I would like to say very simply that, uh, of course, being in a university and being more specifically in a philosophy of the, part, uh, the Department of Philosophy, I would like that to be a place of thinking. And I think that uh, universities in general and AUC in particular also needs also needs to be a place of thinking or it would be very desirable if it was to the extent possible I think more than it actually is and uh, which place in the university would be better suited according to its name at least than the Department of Philosophy to provide or to be a place for thinking. Now, that much said, uh, one must also uh, uh, mention one's experiences with the non-understanding of what I said before, that is to say that uh, it's not often, or it's not necessarily clear that people see the point in having particular places in a university that provides these, uh, uh, that gives these places, that is a place for thinking. There's maybe a non-understanding of what you mean by it, or a, a refusal, uh, so there's also negative experience mixed with the desire and uh, from both the subject that I am intending to talk about a little bit today from both it is born and um, uh, I would also of course as a philosopher I have to go into philosophy itself to see uh, what is said about place and about places to think there. Now, I was struck, I'm going to talk about a number of contemporary philosophers in the course of this talk here, as you will notice. And to begin with, I must mention, or I'd like to mention that I was struck by a text uh, by Gilles Deleu, Deleuze in that, his famous book, What is Philosophy? Actually, it's the first page, the lines that he starts with addressing the question of what is philosophy. And if I read it to you quickly, you'll notice probably what made it interesting 
or made it striking. He says the question, what is philosophy, can perhaps be posed only late in life, with the arrival of old age and the time for speaking concretely. In fact, the bibliography on the nature of philosophy is very limited. It is a question posed in a moment of quiet restlessness at midnight when there is no longer anything to ask. It was asked before, it was always being asked, but too indirectly, too obliquely, the question was too artificial, too abstract. Instead of being seized by it, those who asked the question set it out and controlled it in passing. They were not sober enough. There was too much desire to do philosophy, to wonder what it was. Now, I think it is a very remarkable a first page of an introduction to a book called What is Philosophy? You can notice here that Deleuze situates the question, if not in space, but in time. He says it's a question that appears, or appeared in his case, what he calls at midnight, and a question that is posed in a moment of quiet restlessness. I would like to draw your attention to this motive of quiet restlessness, that will, because it will occur later on in our uh, talk. And also to the nature of the question, namely, he, when he says that a question occurred when there is no longer anything to ask. It's a very remarkable moment for a question, and it also indicates something I would like to talk about uh, under the name of happening, when a question or when thinking is happening, not when it is, as he puts it here, done. These are particular moments and the fact that you introduce a book about what is philosophy by talking about moments, moments in your life, that is to say here old age, moments of a day or time of the day at midnight, I mean, you will not find many philosophical texts. There are other examples there of books in philosophy that bear the same title, What is Philosophy? But you will very rarely find a reference to the, t the time, the when the, of the question. When did that question occur? Not only what is the answer to the question, but when does it occur? When does it happen? So when I read this text for the first time, I was struck uh, if only by its unusualness, that this is not a very common way of speaking philosophy or of philosoph philosophic discourse. So that is one of my inspirations or was one of my inspirations for this talk here. The second one, why talking about place at all? Well, if you go to the history of philosophy, you will find, of course, that uh, this, let's call it, the subject of place was not invented yesterday, or not only in contemporary philosophy. You will find many, many, many uh, indications in contemporary philosophy, or among certain contemporary philosophers, many indications of place becoming, let's call it for a moment, a subject important subject, more and more noticeably so. On the other hand, place uh, is as old as philosophy, but uh, with a very big differences, difference. When you look at Aristotle, you will find passages about place as well. But that is something different. It is different in so far as place may be there the object of thinking. That is to say, what one thinks about, but place does not necessarily and not noticeably become a constituent and a characteristic of thinking itself. In other words, the question is, what has place got to do 
with thinking, not only as an object of thought. I think, or I'd like to kind of just uh, venture this guess, that it has something to do with another term of philosophy, which is a very ancient concern of it, namely the term movement. Again, movement has been uh, the main ingredient of Aristotle's physics, but as a thought or as a concept, or as something to be thought of, thought about, considered, not as a constituent of thinking itself, in other words, of thinking as movement. Now, when movement becomes the constituent of thinking and place is a matter of thought not, or itself, not as an object only, then things start to change. And uh, Deleuze's, the quotation from Deleuze points in that direction. Something has happened in the course of the history of philosophy. What? Another source of my talk in searching about closer to the question of who needs a place to think. Now that question uh, contains words that each one normally would deserve philosophical attention. Who is the one, if anybody needs a place of thought, then who is the one that needs that? Does everybody need it? Or some people? Well, you see here a picture that I came across. You can't really recognize it clearly enough. It's a bench at a river. The river is the River Thames. London, and it says here, everybody needs a place to think. Now, <laughs> uh, somebody sitting there, where the origin is very prosaic, if you might say, not very philosophical, but at the age of Google, you come across these things. Well, what is the origin? It was B the creation of a BBC4, uh, that gave rise to the idea, I mean, they looked for a slogan and said, well, how can we sell BBC4 and how can we make people attentive to it? Well, let's say BBC4 is a place to think, but to make people attentive of it, we will kind of donate a number of benches along the, the Thames and put a little s sign on it that says, everybody needs a place to think. I was told that a few months later uh, the slogan disappeared from BBC4, but the benches are still there. So I don't know what happened to the uh, broadcasting company, but if you want to check it out, you can go there and see. Now, what is interesting about it is why this choice of a place in order to say everybody needs a place to think. Well, it's a place by the river, by the water. It has a bench to sit on. And it allows to do what this gentleman is doing, to sit and look out over the river. Does that picture, does that image convey a place to think? Well, the idea was certainly so. But then what is it about it that does convey this? So in other words, it says something about thinking, and it says something about a place to think. What has it got to do with sitting by the water? And it says that everybody needs a place to think. Not only philosophers or professional thinkers, but everybody. So, of course, this being one of my inspirations for this talk, it led to that question, or it kind of... Uh, uh, explained the question a little bit more to myself. Thirdly, Deleuze's intro, I already read it to you. What does it say about thinking and places? 
the aspect of the fact or the aspect that everybody needs a place to think is in a certain unusual or maybe unexpected way repeated by uh, if you want to sit there are places here it's a place to not a place to think maybe a place to see <laughs> don't have to stand um, it's in a maybe unexpected way repeated and maybe also more sophisticated, philosophically more sophisticated way by a, uh, a very important modern or contemporary thinker called Martin Heidegger. Um, in his introduction to philosophy, he says, being human, mensch sein, means already to philosophize. Being human means already to philosophize. This is my uh, translation, so it's a very rough one. You have to excuse me. Human existence, Dasein, stands as such, or stands as such, and not occasionally, in philosophy. Human Dasein, human existence, stands as such in philosophy. Not occasionally, not from time to time. But because being human has different possibilities, manifold, manifold steps and grades of wakefulness, man can stand in philosophy in different ways. I like to uh, make you aware in this text that I just read to you of two things. First of all, that means also that everyone or everybody, at least as long as they are human, so I have to be careful here, but uh, that again is another aspect of it because it links uh, thinking to human, humanity, humanness being human. So, every human being is already philosophizing. They don't need to philosophize. They are doing it already. Secondly, the way they do this, or the degree or the grade in which they philosophize, depends on what Heidegger calls the grades of wakefulness. So that tells us that philosophizing is a matter of sleep or wakefulness. So every human being, even if they are asleep, they are philosophizing, but on a very low level, so to speak. And the more they wake up, or the more they are awake, the more they philosophize, or the more truly they philosophize. Here again is a motive that will recur later on, that is connected, strangely enough, very often with thinking, namely the matter of awake, uh, being awake, or wakefulness, and sleep. Just take uh, note of it, or mentally now, because you will find it come up, coming up later again. And Heidegger continues by uh, uh, stressing it further by saying the, that philosophy is as sleeping in us. Philosophy is as sleeping in us. It lies in us, but shackled and enmeshed, it is not yet free, not yet in its possible movement. Well, how does it become free? How does it become unfettered or unshackled? He says, we ourselves have to freely grasp and awaken the philosophizing in us. Who is we? Who awakens the philosophizing in us? We awaken ourselves. This is a very unusual way to wake up. Yes? Who awakens the philosophizing in us or who awakens us so that philosophizing becomes awake? Well, Heidegger's answer to that is, you have to get philosophy going. That's a translation of, 
what he calls in gang bringen des Philosophians. In gang bringen means to bring, to walk. Make it go. Now I said something before about philosophy as movement, not philo movement as an object of philosophy. Moving philosophy. Philosophy in motion and moving it. Who moves it? Who moves thinking? What moves it? Philosophy, Heidegger says, does not happen in us yet, I add, as it could and should, should happen in the end. Take note of the word in the end, because that will come up again. So how should or could it happen in the end? In which end? The end of what? Getting it going, it may awaken, and it may happen in us as it could, maybe as Deleuze's question occurred to him and was not done, not, it did not occur by doing philosophy, because the moment was beyond doing philosophy, but philosophy happening, occurring. We will see that Heidegger's end is also philosophy's place. Before we hopefully get there and get going there, it is worth pointing out that this motion, this philosophy or thinking in motion, calls a, a, a famous contemporary philosopher called Sloterdijk in a book on Heidegger called Not Saved. He calls Heidegger the thinker in motion, der Denker in Bewegung. It, this motion has to be gained, its awakening against an ever-recurrent menace of sleepiness, which I hope you don't fall prey to soon to here, which at its worst form can tape, take the shape of thinking itself. So this issue of wakefulness and sleepiness is not something extraneous to philosophy or to thinking. Thinking is in a particular predicament. In one on one hand, it is supposed to be a sign and an indication of wakefulness. Wake up and think. On the other hand, and at the same time, it is ever in danger of becoming another kind of sleep, of automatically go on think going on thinking, of a kind of a thinking routine. Small wonder that although um, Hannah Arendt, who is very important in this context too, she says, she describes thinking again in terms of wakefulness by saying, think, quote, thinking is always out of order, it interrupts all ordinary activities and it is interrupted by them which is a quotation from a chapter in her book called Life of the Mind called Where Are We When We Think? Although, so although, as Aristotle had informed us that philosophy begins from wonder, interruption, even that interruption needs to be interrupted to prevent it from becoming another routine. Small wonder then that Arendt sees in Heidegger the passion of thinking, which is according to her, quote, thinking as pure activity. And this means impelled neither by the thirst for knowledge nor by the drive for cognition. Thinking as pure activity means thinking as pure, pure motion not impelled by the motives of the thirst for knowledge, nor the drive for cognition. Now this is a pretty loaded charge statement, because the, uh, there's a long tradition in philosophy, most clearly expressed again by Aristotle, who with his first sentence of the metaphysics, all men by nature desire to know, desire to know, points out to what she would call, Arendt would call, a thirst for knowledge, 
or the drive for cognition. Now this passion that she identifies by saying Heidegger was an example of somebody who uh, thinking was passionate, neither driven by the thirst for knowledge nor the desire for cognition. This also is expressed in different way and by various of the philosophers that I have already mentioned as a thinking in extremes. And I think it is connected to this issue of wakefulness and sleep. It seems also that the further you go and the closer you come to our own times in and of philosophy, examples like Deleuze or preceding him, Nietzsche and Sloterdijk, that this important or this issue of thinking in the extremes is more and more pressed and more and more stressed. Sometimes more loudly, sometimes barely air audible, but it is there. For instance, uh, Deleuze says in his book Nietzsche and Philosophy, you have to go to extreme places. Ah. Now the place is specified already, not every place is suitable for thinking because there are some places that may make you thinkingly fall asleep. Maybe the bench at the River Thames is an example. Depends. So Deleuze says you have to think, if you want to think, you have to not go, any, to, not go to any, just any place, go to extreme places to extreme times where the highest and deepest truths live, live and rise up. The places of thought, this is still Deleuze, the places of thought are the tropical zones frequented by the tropical man, not temporal zones of the moral, methodical or moderate man. So here we have, he doesn't even distinguish between different places of thought. He very shortly and simply says, the places of thought are the extreme places. Not there are extreme places for thought and there are moderate places for thought, no. What has happened? What leads him to put it like this? It has, has something to do with Developments in modern contemporary philosophy, let's call it developments or motions or movements, that make as if they would make the danger and the antipathy also against anything that is not extreme, that, uh, very, very strong. When, they, when the Deleuze speak about not the temporal, don't go to the temporal zones of the moral man, morality is very, very weak. It's very, uh, it doesn't tell you anything about the passion to think. About th that means about thinking of itself. It's not a place of thought. Methodical man, don't frequent methodical people. Why? Because the people of method are moderate people, they're not extreme people, and method is a way of putting thinking asleep. Now this is a pretty heavy statement if you think about Descartes. What has happened? The call for these places, places that provoke thought in thought, that provoke thought from thought, Places that break the routine of thinking, that revolt against the, quote, subordination of movement to stillness, as Sloterdijk has put it in his Heidegger book, the meaning of thinking in concepts of essence and substance was to subordinate movement to stillness. So we're not thinking in terms and concepts of stillness, uh, of, excuse me, of substance and essence anymore because this is old philosophy, this is ancient philosophy and something happened to make us want to break away from this. It puts us asleep, it puts thinking asleep while it declares itself as the most 
concise and typical and best expression of thinking. If you don't think in essences and substances, then what kind of philosophy do you have? Or what, is, what kind of philosophy is there? Now, this brings with it a separation that had announced uh, itself according to Arendt, Hannah Arendt, already earlier in the history of philosophy, but now develops full strength. The sep namely, the separation within philosophy between knowledge and thinking. Already in the description of the pas passionate thinker that Heidegger was for Arendt, you can notice that distinction when she says the passion of thinking does not pursue thinking for the, to slake the thirst of knowledge or cognition, but it's a passion that, so to speak, runs on itself and so far is passionate. It does not need any motives outside of itself. There you already have indications for a very important distinction that characterizes modern or contemporary philosophy, namely the distinction between knowledge and thinking. In other words, the implication would be philosophy is not the pursuit of knowledge as it is sometimes called, philosophy is thinking. But that means that the two terms, thinking and knowledge, they, uh, they are not invented newly, they are only separate, driven apart by something. Something drives them apart and to, that, to the extent that uh, philosophy is now simply identified with thinking. And knowledge is, so to speak, left outside the door, saying we've got nothing to do with knowledge or the pursuit of knowledge anymore. That is, philosophy as a matter of knowing, or philosophy as a matter of thinking. This separation gains so much weight that it threatens to separate philosophy from thinking itself. Now Kant mentions uh, in her, the life of the mind a forebear of this separation, which is Immanuel Kant. And she mentions, she refers to an expression that he coined which is very important here, it is called the need for reason, or the urgent need for reason. So I'm now, if you kind of noticed, you check, we are at the second term of why uh, does anybody or everybody need a place to think? Is there a need for the place to think? Or does the place to think have nothing to do with needs? Aristotle said that philosophy came only in existence once all the needs of life had been fulfilled. So what do we need? Do we need to think? Do we need a place for thinking? Well, Kant's expression of the need of reason seems to indicate it. Arendt says that this so-called need of reason is connected with Kant's discovery of the, quote, scandal of reason, that is the fact that our mind is not capable of certain and verifiable knowledge regarding matters and questions that it nevertheless cannot help thinking about. The scandal of reason that our mind is not capable of certain and verifiable knowledge regarding matters and questions that it nevertheless cannot think, help thinking about and for him such matters, that is, those with which mere thought is concerned, were restricted to what we now often call ultimate questions of God, freedom and immortality. She continues to say that Kant was quite aware that the urgent need of reason is both different from and, quote, more than the mere quest and desire for knowledge. There you have the separation again. The need for reason for Arendt is not inspired then by the quest for truth, but as she says, by the quest for knowledge. So there is, uh, excuse me, the quest for meaning. So there is still, using the expression quest, there is still some driving force that drives both quests. 
and that allows them both to be called quest, but the difference is between the quest for truth and the quest for meaning. And as she says, truth and meaning are not the same. Now, I can't go too much into that distinction, but I just would wanted to mention it to you because it's an important one in terms of the distinction between philosophy as the quest for truth and thinking as the quest for meaning. That has consequences. So, what then is the famous end of thinking or the end of philosophy that we had heard of earlier from Heidegger when he said philosophy has not reached its end yet. Well, for this we have to go to another text of his. It is called The End of Philosophy and the Task of Thinking. And Heidegger writes there, quote, the old meaning of the word end, remember he said in the other quote I gave you, philosophy has not reached its end yet, meaning it's not fully awake in other words. The old, quote, the old meaning of the word end means the same as place. The old meaning of the word end means the same as place. Qu from one end to the other means from one place to the other. The end of philosophy is the place, that place in which the whole of philosophy's history is gathered in its what? Most extreme possibility. End as completion means this gathering. Now there is a historical explain not an explanation, historical interpretation of this uh, driving apart uh, of knowing or knowledge and thinking itself, but uh, I think I don't want to overburden you here and jump over that. So what for Heidegger is then the end of philosophy or, as he puts it here, the place of philosophy? What is its place? He says it has various aspects. One of them is, I quote, the dissolution of philosophy in the technological sciences. The dissolution of philosophy in the technological science. That is, in, uh, in other words, that means what? If you go to a university and you happen to be, maybe, in one, who knows, it looks like it, you will find a particular landscape. You will find a particular placement of the sciences and you will find a particular placement of the humanity, what is called humanities in the American way of speaking about academics. And you will find a particular placement of philosophy. Philosoph uh, university administrators are very much concerned where to place what, uh, what to place where. <laughs> right? It's very important for them. But Let's say we are not administrators of philosophy or administrators of the sciences, but we are philosophers or thinkers. We are thinking maybe a little bit more awake than everybody thinking. I don't know how extreme. But then what would be the consequence for us? If Heidegger says the end, and that's to say the place, why does he identify the end with the place? It's a linguistic exp explanation, but nevertheless, that is his way of seeing it. The end of philosophy, philosophy in its end, and end, of course, means two things at least. End as that which beyond which there is nothing, and end is the aim or the goal. That's the old philosophical distinction of the telos. So he says, in the, the end is the place, 
And in that end, and in that place of philosophy, what we will see is, quote, the dissolution of philosophy in the technological science. That means they are, so to speak, they are dis the philosophy is dissolved in all the so-called technological science. It's hardly recognizable. And if you would ask any of the scientists of that kind, uh, where is philosophy? Is it not here? Yes, it's dissolved. That's what Heidegger says. It has dissolved. It's everywhere. And that means everyone in the university or every scientist and every student of a science would think, maybe need a place to think, but what is the place if philosophy has dissolved into all the various sciences? Secondly, Heidegger says, and that's the other aspect of the end or the place of philosophy. The end of philosophy means the beginning of the world civilization based upon Western European thinking. Sorry for um, making un unpleasant remarks for some people here, but that is what Heidegger, he, how he puts it, and there may be truth about it. The end of philosophy means the beginning of the world civilization, firstly. What about globalization? What is meant by world civilization? And why does world civilization begin? There's a beginning to that end. Why does it begin there where philosophy ends? At that place. Philosophy ends in its place, at its end, and a world, the world civilization, or what we hear in other terms today under the name of globalization, begins. There is a beginning in that end, and that is based, as he calls it, upon Western European thinking, which is something to really consider uh, if you are trying to understand uh, features or movements of what is called globalization. Because if it's based on Western European thinking, then how global is the concept of globalization? So there is an end and a beginning for Heidegger of philosophy and a task. The, ta the end and the beginning is for philosophy, but the task is for thinking. Thinking has a task and we, as maybe human beings, uh, who have not even wondered who we are, or who is the one who needs the place to think, we as human beings, we are asked to involve, to get involved, to participate in the task of thinking. Whose place is the place of the thinking ego? Philosophically speaking, that means not according to thinking, not according to what we call, could call still for a while philosophy. Arendt says, and this is a very, what we might call traditional definition of it, the essential is what is applicable everywhere, and this everywhere that bestows on thought its specific weight is, spatially speaking, nowhere. The everywhere is, that means the universal, universal claim of philosophy produces a nowhere, or is Nowhere, because it's everywhere. The thinking ego moving among universals, among invisible essences, is strictly speaking nowhere. It is homeless in an emphatic sense, which may explain the ri early rise of a cosmopolitan spirit among the philosophers. I'd like to stress the, word, the expression of the homelessness of the thinking ego. Where is the place to think? there, or somewhere else, or anywhere. Nowhere. And uh, Aaron continues, that nowhere is by no means identical with the twofold nowhere from which we suddenly appear at birth, and into which we almost as suddenly disappear in death. So, how is it to be understood? She says it might be conceived only as the void. So thinking takes place where? In the void. 
What is the void? Can you even ask the question if it's void? Well, she says, it means a limiting boundary concept in closing our thoughts within insurmountable walls. In closing our thought within insurmountable wa walls. But it doesn't tell us more than that we are finite beings. In other words, being in the void only reminds us, meaning us, us, us human beings, that we are of our finiteness. And the finiteness of man is the most important description of Heidegger's, at least in Seinung Zeit, uh, of uh, human Dasein, of human existence, that it is strictly finite. But the finiteness here, strangely enough, aren't dissociates from the beginning and the end that we're identifying with birth and death. So it is a deeper finiteness and a deeper void than even those two. Well, where could we locate then philosophy in the end? What is the place of philosophy? Where is the place of philosophy in the end? Well, I have a whole list of places here from Heidegger's hut to Aaron's grave and the earth and the sky and, and all these places have been mentioned as particular places of philosophy. Not the place though, because that's the concept, but places. Now, but we have left already a while ago philosophy and its concepts or a concept of place in the way that tries to subjugate movement to stillness and therefore we should continue to walk uh, in the motion and with the motion of thinking. Where is the place of philosophy? Sloterdijk, uh, being in a situation that uh, many of us, at least from the faculty, uh, so-called professional philosophers, terrible word, but it's another problem, have been in, he has, there's a very interesting little text of his where he has to justify the existence of philosophy in a particular university of which he is the president of that university. That, that university is a university of, it's called uh, Hochschule für Gestaltung, that means for design. It's a university or high school for design. He's the president for it and he's trying to uh, justify, if not to sell, the good reasons why philosophy should be placed in such a university, that's to say, in the place of the arts. Now, there is one particular word that strikes me in this description. I don't want to kind of go through all of that, but he says here, as long as there is philosophy, it lives in a certain, in certain, te in a certain tension. On one hand, it has a scientific claim on truth. Here, now it has a scientific claim on truth on one hand, which makes it impersonal and universally valid. On the other hand, the philosophical discourse is from its very beginning a personally anchored discourse personally anchored, which is tied to the name of its author as the work of art is tied to the name of the artist. And he continues to say, the anchoring for anchoring of philosophy in the academic space, the anchoring of philosophy in the academic space of the university upsets this balance between science and art, nearly always in favor of a one-sided preference of the impersonal scientific claim. In other words, he, he regrets that philosophy is too much anchored, but it needs to be anchored. It's too much, you want me to finish? Do you come to the place or to the end? I have so many interesting things. It needs to be anchored in the university and he says, well, if it's already uh, needs a place and has to be anchored, then let it be anchored in the arts. 
I don't know if this is some idea uh, that, it, of course, it comes from somewhere, but it is a quite uh, an idea that I have come across uh, recently or uh, several times again closer to home. And it's amazing. Now, what I would like to stress is the need to anchor philosophy. Why does it have to be anchored? Because it's like a boat. If it is not anchored, it will be swimming around or drifting in some bigger water, maybe bigger than this water here, some ocean, and uh, it has no place. What is its place then? All right. So that leads me to my final remarks about the placing of philosophy in the university, in the humanities. Uh, I have to refer to uh, also another difficult thing. All the thinkers that I mentioned here today are difficult, but I hope I made it a little bit easier for you. Namely, Jacques Derrida. What is the place for Derrida? The question is not just what is the place of philosophy, but what is the place for placing it? Who decides and how do we decide where and how to place philosophy? And he says this is particularly important, particularly difficult in a time that we is uh, mentioned that is characterized by certain features. He says here, I quote from that uh, from a, the text. I haven't given the title yet. Quote, this new technical stage of virtualization, now we get closer, you notice, the place becomes closer, of virtualization, computerization, digitalization, virtually immediate worldwideization, globalization, of readability, telework, and so forth, destabilizes, as we well know, the university habitat. It upsets the university's topology, that's the logic of places. It disturbs everything that organizes the places defining it, namely the territory of its fields and its disciplinary frontiers, as well as its places of discussions, its fields of battle, and the communitary structure of the campus, its, quote, campus. Where is to be found the communitary place and the social bond of a campus in the cyberspatial age of the computer, of telework, and of the World Wide Web? Where does the experience of democracy, be it a university democracy, have its place in what my colleague Mark Poster calls cyber democracy? One has to a, the clear sense that more radically what has been upset in this way is the topology of the event, the experience of the singular taking place. Where do these things take place? How does something, not just what is the place, but how do places take place? These are very political, communi community-concerned issues that are of importance, I think, for everybody and anybody maybe who is in, the university, in a university and who furthermore intends to stay awake as much as possible and think. I have more interesting things to say, but I'm not going to tell you. Because this one here makes me nervous. <laughs> Yanni, I have five minutes left, but this is for discussion, right? <sighs> All right, well, that's just the starting now. Thank you very much for your attention, nevertheless. <laughs> I have another picture. I had another picture about places, and I actually, ah, it's up there. So I wanted to ask everybody what they see when they look at both places. Anyhow, uh, we have a little bit of time for discussion or for asking questions. Please go ahead. What is this? 
flattened, <laughs> rolled over, think, are you asleep? No, you're thinking. Yes. Who decides where and how to place thinking, to place philosophy? Um, and then going back to the problem of sleep versus wakefulness, why have we decided that philosophy, that real thinking, cannot occur in these liminal spaces between sleepfulness and wakefulness in other states of, of consciousness? Between sleep and wakefulness? Yes, or in ah. sleep, but rather in other states of consciousness other ah. than yes. wakefulness. Well, uh, that, where we have decided that, or who has decided that, uh, in Hannah Arendt's book, uh, The Life of the Mind, there is a motto of Plato, which I wanted to read to you, but I don't, uh, that says, refers to your question, it's basically, and it's a common motive, that says, uh, while man is alive, uh, he is asleep. And when he wakes, when he dies, he wakes up. So, yeah, this is, a, and the, the, uh, the, the sleep, uh, where's the, oh, yeah, Goya here, the sleep of reason engenders monsters. Oh, yeah. Yeah, your former poster. Uh, the uh, sleep is associated with reason or sleepfulness and both wakefulness at the same time. This is, it's as if thinking is in a constant battle between uh, interruption, because, you know, as Aaron says, if you think, you, have, you interrupt. You cannot think, so to speak, in the middle of things. Thinking interrupts, or if uh, the middle of things, that's to say the noise around you, comes back to you, it interrupts your thinking. So the idea of thinking is connected with interruption. So, and this is why I said, if you look at the, the, the photograph here of this man sitting on a bench at the River Thames, you have to ask yourself, why did they choose that as a place for thinking? What is it about it? The river, the boats, and the, the, the bench at the banks of the river. What, what does that uh, have to do with thinking? Is that a particular place to think? Why? Uh, yeah, so, that these were, would be things we have to take into consideration. Now, as to the in-between states, or why sleep is not a place of thinking, the, the, that, of course, uh, it can also be answered further on by saying, for it is uh, something that is related to the issue of consciousness. Because uh, we are living, of course, in the age of psychoanalysis that gives way to the dreams in a way that, in a, in a scientific way that was not done before. But uh, they are, if you go to the different stages of sleep between uh, dream the dream state, which might be still considered as relevant to thinking, and the sta sleepless or dreamless state, which is a difficult thing to consider for, as relevant for thinking, then the reason for that, why these distinctions are made, have something to do with co what we call consciousness or awareness. Deep sleep means, dreamless state means that you have no awareness or there's no consciousness of anything. So what does that t tell you about thinking? Maybe it will tell you something about thinking if you look at this picture. And at least I would kind of invite you to give that a, a little idea. But on the whole, um, uh, there is a, let's call it, traditional association with sleep as the absence of thought, or as uh, it's later put, with a routine of thought and not real thought, and wakefulness as the moment of thinking. That's repeated and repeated and repeated again. I think it deserves a particular attention that was expressed in your question, I think. Why is that so? Why do we associate so much uh, thinking or not thinking with sleep or wakefulness? To give you one idea I have quickly, I think it has something to do with death. Well, that's to say what uh, uh, 
the death of reason, which uh, aren't called the void. I, or our so-called finiteness. So why is it, okay? Let's just keep it. There. Yeah. Oh, on that help, happy note. What? <laughs> on that happy note, I think we're gonna have to call it a day today, Stefan. Really? Yeah. Unless people want to stay, you're more it's than welcome. It's all free, very free. kind of uh, uh, enthusiastic uh, questioning. No. Right. If you don't, then keep it to yourself, and maybe we have another chance to talk about it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.